Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. It's a girl Fanny Lungu back with another reaction video. If you're new to this channel, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. Today, we're going to be reacting to what really happened when Muslims conquered Christian lands, Muslim history by Muhammad Hijab. So, without wasting time, let's get into the video. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to the third episode talking about the conquests um, the Islamic conquests and some of their implications in the last episode we talked about how the Prophet of Islam Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well as the Quran predicted the um, that the, the Arabian Peninsula will be overcome by the Muslim in this episode we're going to be talking about the spread of Islam in among the Christian nations of Western Asia. In the last episode, we talked about the spread of Islam from the area of uh, Yathrib, which then became known as Medina, to the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, we talked about how that is in line with the predictions of the Quran and the Sunnah. The predictions mentioned in the Quran, for example, in chapter 24, verse 55, and also in chapter 48 of the Quran, where there's explicit mention of Muslims overcoming their enemies in the in that in that area. Today we're going to be talking about the some of the what are referred to as Ghazawat, some of the um, expeditions, uh, conquests, Futuhat that took place um, in those Christian nations of Western Asia. And most particularly, we're talking about the implications this had for the Roman Empire and to a lesser, uh, lesser extent at this stage, the Persian Empire as well. So, when the Prophet Muhammad wasallam passed away in the 11th year of Hijrah, he left Abu Bakr al-Siddiq in control. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, was a man of Sunnah, was a man who followed the Prophet Muhammad wasallam in everything that he did. And he saw the wisdom in that. He saw that the tawakkul, the reliance that he has on the injunctions of Allah and his messenger was paramount to his success in this world and the year after. And this is why he is actually referred to as As-Siddiq, um, the truthful one, and also the one who does Tasdiq, in a sense, which means he, he's a believer of, uh, in this case, Prophet Muhammad. He was an intense believer of his, his message. And so when it came to the expedition, or the dispatched army to Syria, when there were contentions, obviously from his people in his area, about him going to try to attack the Roman Empire, as it were, at this stage, he replied, I will not revoke any order given by the Prophet. This shows the intense obedience he had to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam and Allah, which brings us back to our lesson from last week, which is, if you believe in the metaphysical promise of Jannah uh, and the threat of hell and so on and so forth, then physical rewards come to you in this world. When Sir Thomas Walker Arnold was referring to this and many other um, expeditions that would take place, he said that this was the first of a wonderful series of campaigns in which the Arabs overcame Syria Persia and northern Africa, overpowering the ancient kingdoms of Persia and despoiling the Roman Empire of some of its fairest uh, of some of its fairest provisions. Now, we've got to remember the Persian and the Roman Empire are no joke, really, in the uh, in the historical records. They are two of the greatest empires that ever existed. And we're talking about something quite dramatic. And we've also got to remember that the Prophet Muhammad himself did predict in many hadiths, he predicted the overcoming of both the Persian and the Roman Empire. Now, if you remember from last episode, we talked about the fact that the Prophet Muhammad was in Ghazwat Khandaq, which is Al-Ahzab, one of the wars where there were 10,000 people threatening in Medina and they dug trenches around that area to protect themselves. There were around 10,000 people are trying to attack the Muslims. And in that context, the Prophet Muhammad 
he predicted that Asham would be overcome by the Muslims, which is the Levant region. He also predicted in other hadiths that Asham would never again be ruled, uh, ruled by Rome. In, a, in another hadith, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this hadith is Sahih. He said, U'dud sitten bayna yaday sa'ah. He says, count six things before the day of judgment. The first thing is says, Moti, thumma fatah, baytul maqdisi. He says, after that, the opening of Jerusalem or the conquest of Jerusalem. Today, we're going to be speaking a little bit about Asham or the Levant region and how that was to a great extent overcome. But we're also going to be focusing on Fatah Beit al Maqdis or the conquest of Jerusalem. Now, you've got to remember at this stage you had people like Khalid ibn Walid, who was referred to as the sword or one of the swords of the swords of Allah. And there were many skirmishes and battles that took place, like Yarmouk, for example, which was a Muslim victory, or Al Qadisiyah, which was also a Muslim victory. And in Al Qadisiyah, something really interesting happened. If you recall, we said that the Prophet said that Persia would be overcome, but he made an even more specific prediction to Suraq ibn Jahsh in a hadith which is narrated in Bukhari. Where he told Suraq ibn Jahsh, who was a Sahabi at that time, that he will hold the treasures of Kisra. Kisra being the leader of the Persian Empire. Now, in the Battle of Al Qadisiyah, not only did the Muslims defeat the Persians, but they did so winning a lot of the war booty, including, of course, the, the treasures of Kisra which is something Umar ibn Khattab even spoke to Suraq ibn Jahsh about that this is the wa'ad or this is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam coming true. So we talked about the battle of Qadisiyah which was a big upset and from a historical perspective one of the reasons why that was a win for the Muslims is because according to Tabari one of the famous Muslim historians, Rustum or Rastum, who was one of the the generals in that war, he stopped giving subsidy to um, the guards that would guard the borders uh, of the Byzantine Empire. So Heraclius, or Heraclius was not particularly uh, savvy when it came to politics to the extent whereby, well, he lost the war completely here in the Battle of Qadisiyah. But there were other battles that took place around this time and we're talking like the battle of the bridge which took place in the 13, 13th year AH um, which also was a Muslim victory battle of Buayb which also was a Muslim victory there are many battles that we can't mention or enumerate all in this uh, particular episode the main thing we're going to talk about of course is the Fatah of Beit al-Maqdis but before we do so I guess one of the greatest contentions against these battles and conquests is the fact that people will say, well, this was something which, you know, proves the barbarity and the imperial nature of Muslim people. Well, if you look at some of the historical sources, including the book, The Preaching of Islam by Sir Thomas Walker Arnold, who is an Orientalist, by the way, but who candidly admits in his chapter on this, on, on, on the Western uh, which he calls the spread of Islam among the Christian nations of Western Asia, he candidly admits that toleration extended towards the Christian Arabs by victorious Muslims. Now, he says this, he says, we may surely infer that those Christian tribes that did embrace Islam did so of their own choice and free will. That Christian Arabs of today, living in the midst of of the Mohammedan population are a living testimony to this kind of toleration. When he abbreviates some of the reasons why people became Muslim in his very contents page, Sir Thomas Arnold actually does not mention conversion by compulsion as one of the reasons. In fact, he, he mentions the rational, rationality of the Islamic faith 
and he is an Orientalist. At any rate, these expeditions, these conquests, secured Muslim victory in that area where a crumbling Roman Empire was now at awe in the sight of Muslim victory and Muslim bravery. Spearheaded, of course, by the great Sahaba, starting with Abu Bakr Siddiq and moving swiftly on to the main man himself who was responsible for such obliterating defeats left, right and center, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. So, Romans, throughout their dominions, cruelly plundered our churches. Who said this? Michael the Elder said this. And this is one of the reasons why Muslim, the Muslim invasions, if they were to be called that, were actually welcomed by populations. Michael the Elder was a Jacobite um, patriarch of Antioch. And you can see this in primary source materials like Chronicle Ecclesiastical. Michael the Elder said, Romans who throughout their dominions cruelly plundered our churches and our monasteries and condemned us, yes, brought from the region of the south, the sons of Ishmael, who deliver us from the hands of the Romans. And this is a Christian source. It interrupts this narrative, this Orientalist, or I should even say right-wing narrative, because frankly this was not the understanding of early Orientalists even. This, was, this is more of a right-wing narrative. It interrupts that narrative that in fact Christians were resisting. The reality is that because of the 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 the, uh, the friction between the Jacobites Christians and the church, many Christians were were happy to see Muslims come in to take them out of the confusion that had ensued for many centuries, for many centuries, because of the church and because of the hypostatic union controversy which took place, which is very well known in history. So much so that you can find this in a book called Futuh al-Sham for Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Azdi where one of the Christians wrote the following he says Muslims we prefer you to the Byzantines because you keep better faith and you are more merciful so what happened is you had one of the biggest Futuhat which was of course the Fath of Damascus and there was a consorted effort between Amr ibn al-Khattab and Amr ibn al-As and uh, Abu Ubaidah and others who all decided to go for Dimashq, Damascus first and then things would, like a domino effect, be in the Muslims' favor one after the other. A question could be asked here, when you're going to these Muslim, the different lands, what would the Muslims do in terms of the jizya? Now listen to this. Once again, we refer to our Orientalist friend, Thomas Walker Arnold. He said the jizya was levied on able-bodied males in lieu of the military service they would have been called upon to perform. It is noticeable that when Christian people served in the Muslim army, they would have been exempted from paying this tax. In other words, it was understood in the pre-modern world that jizya was something, was a kind of tax you're, you're paying for protection. Because these army men are not going to do their job for free. They are protecting you and there's taxes in every country. So even Orientalists like Thomas Walker Arnold candidly admit that the jizya was in fact something which is a symbol of toleration rather than of, of, of oppression. And he mentions this, in fact, in his book. And he also mentions that Christians had high posts in the areas where Muslims were in control, like al Akhtan, who was a court poet of jo um, and the father of John of Damascus, a very famous 
church father. But other people he mentions, which we don't have time to mention here. The point is this, is that when the Muslims took over Damascus, so we have, just to kind of summarize the timeline, we have the Battle of Yarmouk, then we have the Battle of Qadisiyah, then you have some of conquests of the Bilad of Faris, of the Persians, and then you have going into Hims. So the Muslims are moving from one place to another. And then you have, of course, the big one itself, which is Fatah Bayt al Maqdisi, the conquest of Jerusalem. One of the pro prophetic predictions of the Prophet Muhammad. Sallam. And what a prediction that is. It's not an easy thing to say that you will conquer as a band of small number of Arabs that we talked about in the previous episode that were being tortured, that those individuals are going to conquer Jerusalem. This was, this is big history. This is serious history. And this is irrefutable history as well. So what happened was, Abu Ubaidah, he had 10 leaders and each of those leaders had five leaders. They went to the Romans. First, they went to, as we said, Hems. They, and then they opened up Damascus. So, under the leadership of Abu Ubaidah, Amr ibn al-As, Yazid ibn uh, Sufyan, and others, Khalid ibn Walid, of course, the whole city of Damascus was surrounded in 70 nights. They sent letters to Heraclius, and they came in with the takbirat, Khalid was fear, fierce and fighting. They would offer them to duels one on one. And they didn't want anything to do with that. Because who would want to fight the Khalid bin Walid, Amr bin As, and those individuals? And this was the siege of Damascus. But after Damascus, of course, you had Hims, 14 AH. Then you had Fath Hubayt al Maqdis. When Abu Ubaidah finished with Dimashq, he wrote to the people calling them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He surrounded Jerusalem just like they did with Damascus. And they said, they said, the people of Jerusalem, after long days, maybe 90 days, Ibn Kathir, he says, in Badaw al Nihaya, he says maybe 90, maybe four months, maybe this, maybe that. When he went into Jerusalem, they said, look, we won't give you the city unless you bring your Khalifa himself, Amr ibn al-Khattab. Amr al-Khattab consulted with people. He consulted with Ali ibn Abi Talib and Uthman al Affan. Uthman, he said, look, don't do it. You know, stay in your city, be safe. Ali said, no, go and do it. So he took Ali's view. 16 AH, Amr ibn al-Khattab, he went into, he went into Jerusalem. And the manner in which he did so, was in a humble way to mimic the way in which the Prophet Muhammad he conquered Mecca and he let his servant ride the camel sometimes and he would ride the camel sometimes he came in with very modest clothing and the and the church clergyman who actually wanted to see if this man fit in with a description that they had of a prophetic of something in their own books and their own understandings was the man that they thought he was noticed his humility and noticed that he is the man that in fact we have been awaiting so they gave the city to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu and Umar ibn al-Khattab went in and he built a masjid next to a sakhra next to a big rock and until this day it's called Masjid Umar ibn al-Khattab and he prayed in the masjid and he did not pray by the way he did not pray in the church in the, one of the main churches because he said if you see me praying there you're going to take over their church so he cared about he cared about the situation of the christians and the jews in in that area and so much so that he said to the people when he went inside and this is even mentioned in the books of the orientalists that when that we we will not affect you in the sense that you can choose whatever religion you want to choose we will not break your salib your crosses we will not destroy your churches and he even gave people pensions from the christians and the jews 
And this flies right in the face of the Orientalist narrative. This flies right in the face of the Orientalist narrative. And in fact, not even the Orientalist narrative, because this is, to be fair, mentioned in some Orientalist books, but some New Age right-wing narratives. It flies right in the face of those narratives. But when that happened, and there was a strong presence now in Jerusalem, there was an attack attempt to try and regain the city, which was squashed by Amr al-Khattab, Amr ibn al-As, Khalid ibn walid and these other lions of Islam. And the matter had been settled. The matter had been settled. The Muslims had overtaken Jerusalem and overtaken large swathes of the western parts of the eastern Byzantine Roman Empire, as well as posed a considerable threat to the Persian Empire. Islam was strong and it was strong because of the bravery and the strength and the fortitude and the persistence and the iman of those great scholar, those scholars and Sahaba, Amr al-Khattab, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Amr ibn al-As, Khalid ibn Walid, Abu Ubaidah, and of course the list goes on and on and on. In next week's episode, or next time's episode, we're going to be talking about North Africa and how Islam went into Egypt. Another prediction by the Prophet Muhammad which came true, and I hope to hear from you then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What exactly is this video trying to say? Um, is it referring... I'm trying to put my thoughts together. The person that was telling this story, are they trying to say that um, the, the Christians um, benefited from being conquered? I mean, conquering is conquering. Look at how the, emperor, how the Ottoman Empire was conquering these um, places or the Roman Empire. Would you say that's a good thing? Conquering is conquering at the end of the day. If you have to fight someone to take over their land, then that's that. I mean, we shouldn't justify certain things. We're going to look at this video and say Muslims conquering Christian lands is fine. But when we're going to look at the Roman Empire conquering a country and say, no, that's not fine. I feel like there's a double standard there. The history behind how things happen is always interesting to know. Otherwise, other than that, do you really think the Christians were like, okay, fine, conquer us, we're going to do better because you stick to one thing that you preach perhaps otherwise let me know what you think i don't know how to feel, feel about conquering people but just let me know how to, what you think make sure to give this video a thumbs up share it with your friends and of course do not forget subscribe and i'll see you in my next reaction video